morning, church. My name is Deanna. If I've not met you before, I'm one of the associate pastors here. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. We're so glad that you're able to join us. Sounds like it's going to be a bit of a downer, though. Did you catch that with the intro? I drew the, the short straw, so. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we've been working through the Genesis series, and it's answering some of those ex, ex I have as trouble saying this sort of existential those hard to answer questions, where did we come from? Who am I? What is this world all about? You know, if you've missed any of those sermons, you know, I would encourage you to check out the social channels so you can catch up on those because there's some good stuff in there answering questions that, you know, you may have been pondering your whole life. But did you ever wonder why everything is so messed up? And maybe you already have some answers for this. You're like, I can tell you exactly why things are messed up because I know. But you know what, Um, this world, you don't have to look too far to see things like global warming, crime, poverty, depravity, corruption, it surrounds us. And that's in our whole big world, and it shows us that it's broken, and it kind of makes us sad, and we want to fix it. You know, maybe your own personal world is falling apart a bit. That happens to us all. They say misery loves company. So if you've come into this place feeling a bit broken, you are in good company. We are all broken. This is the good news message we have today. We're all a mess. (laughs) But you know what? Knowing that just kind of takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it? I think that it does. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and that that puts so much pressure on me. But no, and and my husband, apparently. (laughs) But knowing that or accepting that brokenness uh, is where we can begin to heal. So before that, I wanted to share a story with you from this week. I have a cousin, um, my cousin Michael. We grew up as kids together. uh, We'd get to see each other at holidays in Indiana uh, when we were kids. And we struck up conversation a few years ago on social media. And we keep in touch every since to keep to find out what's going on in each other's lives even though we live so far apart. Now, Michael's a lawyer. He works for NASCAR in uh, Hendrix Motorsports. I think I got the name of the company right, so all you race heads out there. My cousin here is a uh, race lawyer uh, in North Carolina, as in auto racing. And, you know, he was asking me, he says, when wasn't your sister's birthday just recently? And I said, yeah, yeah, it was August 20th. And he's like, mine too. And I'm like, really? I didn't know that you guys had the same birthday. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And he says, is she more, he asked me the question, is she more like a Holland or a Conley? In other words, my mom's family or my dad's family? You know, and I had to stop and think about that. Now, the Conley family, they're a little bit more generous of size. They're very mechanically minded, large family, down to earth, jovial, very positive tending people, um, down to earth. The Hollands, on the other hand, you know, they can be sweet as pie and sell you just about anything and be, turn around and be just as mean as a snake, okay? <laughs> and, and I thought, they have their good qualities too. <laughs> but, you know, th- this one thing that they, uh, they just, yeah, it, it's just interesting to compare those two. So I'm thinking about my sister and thinking, hmm, Holland or Conley? And I thought, oh, she's definitely a Holland. Yeah, she can be just so sweet. Sugar wouldn't melt in her mouth, as they say in the South but she can be, turn around and just be mean as a cut snake like that. And before you think I'm being really hard on my sister, I take after the Hollands too, <laughs> in that way. Sometimes when I, I slip into my um, lower self, I'll say. So I told my cousin, yeah, she's definitely a Holland. I sa- and I told him that and he says, yeah, she sounds like a Holland. But you know what? We all inherit certain identifiable traits from our families, wherever we came from. The way we see the world, our genetic makeup, our abilities, whether they be artistic, musical, sport. Um, I was talking to Stan about this this week and he said, oh, that was my problem. We had no athletic ability in our family despite the fact that I love sport. But even certain diseases, and sometimes we call it the family curse. So, you know, one of my family curses is the lack of a pronounced chin, which I have been so insecure about my whole entire life. Thank you, Dad. (laughs) But we, 
you know, when we know these things, sometimes it can mean that we can actually get some testing done. Now, I can't do anything about my chin, but I can get tests done to look for preventative measures for diseases that might run in my family. And, you know, even if you're an adult, adopted if you were adopted as a child, those genetic markers in your DNA are still there from where you, your biological ancestors. You know, the same is true for us in the spiritual realm. And most of you would already know that. We're going to see if we can answer the question today, what have we inherited from our shared ancestry of humanity? We all are human, after all. You know, if you have your Bibles, might look like this, might look a different. Turn to cha Genesis chapter 3, that's where we'll be today. If you have a device, that works to you. But um, before we jump in at chapter 3, <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, the Lord placed man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. God's a straight shooter. He laid down a very clear boundary for man. And God warned man of the consequences if he chose to ignore that boundary. We know from last week that Adam and Eve were both naked and not ashamed. God had declared his creation not only good, but with this goodness came a beautiful innocence. We get just a glimpse of this in very young children. You know, we don't have to teach our children to tell a lie or to do naughty things, do we? That's not something we try to teach them. But, you know, one of the things I notice about small children is that they have no shame when it comes to being naked. Now, my grandchildren, we have six that are four and under, and they, they are just free as a jaybird um, with their nakedness sometimes when it comes time to bath, and there's no shame. They have no shame. They have no body image issues. We, in, we learn those things later. And they aren't weighted down with the worries and the guilt and the problems of life. They are just so free. And we envy that because then we grow up and we realize that um, things aren't as simple as that. But you know what? Innocence frees us from guilt and shame. Genesis, we're going to start reading in Genesis 3, 1 through 3. It says this, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from, did he, oh, let me try again, did God not really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Now, her reply to this was this, of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, for if you, if you do, you will die. Herein raises the question, a question was raised. Problems start, you know, and I was thinking about this this week, when we question or add to God's instructions that have been given. I don't know if you picked that up, but she added a little bit to what she'd been instructed. And that serpent questioned what she had been told. You know, I want to start with the serpent and look at him just a little bit. Some things I want you to realize is that that serpent was a created being. And remember, in the last few weeks, we've learned that God declared that his creation was good. However, this was no ordinary creature. This was Satan. And you might be asking, how do you know it was Satan? Yes, historically, we know this through, you know, all the years we've spent in Sunday school and church and kids, men. But we can actually look at Scripture, and Scripture tells us throughout Scripture, uh, especially in the book of Revelation, the devil... Satan is referred to as the serpent. 
You know, some people imagine that the devil or Satan, the serpent, is just a personification of evil. It's not really a person, but just a personification of evil. However, Satan is a person, and it's clearly revealed to us throughout Scripture. He goes by some other names. Some of those are like Lucifer, maybe you've heard that name, or Apollyon, which is, actually translates destroyer. He is characterized as a dragon in parts of Scripture, and he's known as the father of lies. There are other descriptors as well. You know, kind of like I have the name Deanna. Some people call me Dee. Some people call me Nan or Nana. Some people call me Mama. We have different names that we go by. I'm still the same me. Satan was an angelic leader. He was a beautiful musical creature, as if we can glean this from parts of Scripture. He was a prince. In fact, we're, he is known as the prince of the power of, the, of this world. So he was a leader, had leadership in his background. He was lifted up with pride and he led an angelic rebellion. You may be familiar with this. That is where demons come from. God created the angelic realm of creatures who serve him in heaven. We read about angels throughout all of scripture. Satan drew a third of the good angels away in a rebellion before humanity was created. And we know it happened before humanity was created because the serpent shows up in the garden. Satan shows up in the form of the serpent. A Bible verse that might be helpful for you to see, a little picture of this, comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of God. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, for you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high God. Sound a bit proud? Satan wanted to be God. For this rebellion, he and his followers have been sentenced to eternal punishment at the end of the ages. But in the meantime, we find him here in the garden. He draws Eve in by a seemingly innocent question. He laid a trap for, did God say this? She exaggerated God's command. We can only speculate why. We don't know why she added to it. But let's keep reading because I want you to see the contradiction that Satan said. You won't die, the serpent replies to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God knowing both good and evil. He tempted her with that thing that he wanted himself to be like God. You know what? This is what we learn. We learn that God commands and Satan contradicts. He's corrupted the message often, and that's why our world is in such a mess. The enemy still tries this approach with us today. He causes us to question or to ignore God's truth that's revealed to us through his word. Did God really say we shouldn't lust after others? What harm could it do? Desire's natural, isn't it? You deserve to have what others have, even if you have to cheat or steal or lie to get it. It's all about you and what's good for you. And then we buy into that because it sounds good. Oh, yeah, it's about me. It's about me. Because we start to doubt the truth that we've learned or been taught. Or maybe you didn't grow up in church and maybe you didn't learn the truths from Scripture. You know that the Bible does tell us that, that God's truth is written on our very hearts. Nature declares his handiworks, and he's written his truth on each and every heart. That's our conscience that helps us know right from wrong. And if we are Christians or followers of Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, bringing us conviction. And you know, what I see happening is sometimes we exaggerate God's commands, you know, trying to be so religious, like Eve, we add to them. And this is faulty legalism or empty religiosity. If I do enough good that outweighs my bad, I'll be okay. That's not what God's word says. Now, we fail to see the harm as we look around and we see others that are doing it. They're doing it. They seem to get away with it. Seems to be okay. We will then override the boundaries that God himself has set for us. And in so doing, we doubt his love that, you know what, he just wants to be the buzzkill, the one that just gives us rules and regulations to ruin our lives. 
But these very boundaries that God set are important. They do demonstrate his love. And when we choose to ignore the warning of consequences for momentary pleasure, it displays our lack of trust and faith in his goodness. You know, we buy into what's known as a noble lie. You can be something that you can never really be, like or equal to God. We desire this illusion of control, and I say it is an illusion because we think we can make up our own rules and determine our own destiny, when in reality, we can't. Instead of good, we want better. We are never satisfied. And nothing is new, though. I just want to encourage you with that because it sounds a little bit heavy. We'll end on a positive note, I promise you. There is a choice that mankind made. And I'd sad to say that the choice wasn't the right one. The woman was convinced of Satan's lies. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. The Bible tells us at that moment, at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed some fig leaves together to cover themselves. They wanted to fix it, but it was too late. You know, guilt and shame come when we choose our own way over God's way, and the Bible calls that sin. Let that sink in a minute. Theologians refer to this as the fall, the fall of man. Sin has made its grand entrance into the world. At that very moment that they disobeyed, they felt shame. Humanity still feels that shame today. Some things that you should know about sin is this. It follows a common pathway. Just like it did in the garden, we notice through those verses that sin is pleasing to the eye. Eve looked and saw the beautiful tree. She saw that it was good. This is known as the lust of the eyes. It looked delicious. She had a desire to consume the forbidden. Don't we all? You know what? I wish that Brussels sprouts tasted as good as chocolate cake. We desire to consume the forbidden, not that chocolate's forbidden. That's the lust of our flesh. And then she wanted to know and experience to be more, that's that pride of life. You know, there's uh, the Apostle John writing, he wrote some things for us that help summarize this in the New Testament. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and the pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. He goes on to write, And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We have a choice to make, just like Eve had a choice. Our choice is our way or God's way. Note, sin seldom affects just us. It creates these ripples and they hurt others. And sin seeks to draw in others as well. Adam was there with Eve in the garden. And, you know, I I find it curious. He didn't try to stop her. At least we don't have record that he tried to stop her. Instead, he joined in with her because sin seeks to draw others in. It's really sad, isn't it? It's really sad. There was not any coming back from this. There was no return to innocence after this. Not yet. You know, our reality is that sin is a big trade-off. We can choose it. We can choose to do the wrong things. We can choose to do the right things. It's a good thing that our righteousness doesn't rely on that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if we compare sin's way to God's way, it's like trading truth for a lie. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to be lied to. 
I can handle just about anything, but please don't lie to me. And I know that sometimes we lie to try to protect other people, but you know what? We only, that only works for a while. Sometimes we lie to ourselves and say that, oh, we're okay when we're really not okay. God sees right through it. We don't fool him for a moment. This lie that we often buy into, it causes us to doubt and to question God and the boundaries that he's set for us. These boundaries aren't bondage, but actually freedom. Do you know in psychology that having boundaries, clearly defined boundaries, is what actually makes us feel secure? Did you know that? We find our security in having limits where they're clearly understood. When we ignore this or when we don't have this, it creates a sense of fear or insecurity and a need to hide. You know, you don't have to worry about the lie you told if you didn't tell the lie to start with. You just stick to the truth and you'll be okay. Sin gives into cravings of the flesh that are never satisfied. Do you know that? And it leads us to things like disease, addiction, and shame. Because we take a little bit, and then we want a little bit more, and a little bit more, and before we know it, it is destroying us. Sin promises pleasure, and it is pleasurable. I'm not going to lie to you. Sin is fun, but it's temporary. It holds that little bit of truth back, and it results in hurt and loss and brokenness. Do not doubt that. Do not doubt that. Sin drives discontent. It is this elusive carrot that we can never seem to get. The more we get, we just want more, and we're never satisfied. The Bible tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. And you know, the sin, because we want what we want, and we don't care about who it hurts, that it drives a wedge between us. It alienates us from God and from each other, and it creates this conflict. That's what's broken in the world. Everybody's going after their own way. There is none righteous, no, not one, and conflict abounds. Ultimately, sin trades the eternal life for eternal death and destruction. It's a pretty bleak picture. Ultimately, sin, though, is a great equalizer. Did you know that? It equalizes. It doesn't discriminate, in other words, based on age or status or race or gender or belief. It's non-discriminatory. We are born with sin, the sin nature. The Bible tells us this, for everyone, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You know, and because of this, there are consequences. There is a curse. That's what we're talking about today. We know that sin and guilt demand consequences. That's what justice is. So creation was cursed. God said, if you do this, there will be consequences. Now, we're not going to look at the specifics of the consequences that were handed down. It was in our scripture reading. You can go back and read it if you missed it. But I do want to point out just a few observations I made this week. In this scenario in the garden, each person, each individual had to answer for their own choice, okay? There was, no fing- there was some finger pointing, but they each had to answer. God held them each to account. When God asked the two questions in the very beginning, he came walking in the garden. He said, where are you? Where were they? They were hiding. They were trying to hide from God. We hid because we were afraid. And then God asked him, who told you you were naked? And you know what? What I observed is they didn't answer him. They didn't say, oh, well, you know, we ate the tree and we realized it ourselves. They just failed to answer. They had nothing they could offer, really. But what they did try to do is they tried to shift focus away from their self onto others. And I see this all the time. I do a lot of counseling, and every time, you know, somebody comes into me and they start telling me of their challenges in life and their problems and stuff, there's always people to blame that's causing all their problems. Did you know that? pretty common thing. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes people do give us um, some really things that we have to wrestle with in life. But I always tell them pretty much the same thing. 
you know, we can talk about that and I can help you drain some of that pain away, but we are here to work on you because you are the only one that we can change. Can't change anybody else, but we can work on you. So blaming others only takes us so far. It's when we own our own stuff and we work to change us that things improve. We can't blame others for our own bad choices. In this case, Eve blamed the serpent. She said, it was the serpent's fault. He tempted me. You ever try to use that excuse in your own life? The devil made me do it. If your kids do the wrong thing, you tell them, don't do that, and they do it anyways, you think that they're going to get off the hook if they said, oh, but mommy, the devil made me do it. I don't think so. I told you not to. You did it anyways. There are consequences. Same thing with that police officer that pulls you over, and you know you were going too fast. I don't think he's going to buy. The devil made me do it. Not going to work. It didn't work with God either. You know, Adam ultimately blamed God. He said, the woman you gave me. You know, it's subtle, but it's there. The woman you gave me, God. God, this is your fault. And doesn't our world do that? It's like the world's falling apart, and, and we've done all these things that just continue to create more and more of a mess, and we blame God? Well, if he's so good, why is the world so bad? Well, I'll tell you why. It isn't his fault. We are prone to do this in our individual lives. God made me this way. If he didn't want me to sin, why would he make sin so enjoyable? He didn't stop me. If he's all-powerful, he didn't stop me. But you know what? He gives warning to us about so many things of life. This is a life manual. You'll see a lot of people that got it wrong and the consequences for it. And you'll see the, the way that God designs for you to live in the pages of Scripture. His revealed truth tells us what a good life looks like. He sent prophets to share with God's people, challenge God's people to do the right thing. Pastors, friends, and family, there's a wisdom and a multitude of counselors, the Bible tells us. And yet sometimes we just want to stuff our ears and not listen. But you know what? Each person, just like in the garden, was held accountable and all of creation was cursed when they failed to listen. And it was forever damaged and broken Blame shifting didn't work with God for them, and it doesn't work for us. They were each held responsible for what they had done. And you know what? They weren't considered victims. That's the thing. That's what uh, blame shifting often does. And I'm not diminishing the fact that there are some true victims in this world because of the depravity of humankind. But Adam and Eve weren't victims in fact, the fact that God held them accountable gave them dignity of agency and this accountability that showed that they had value, that they weren't just helpless um, Yeah. I was just thinking about how often I see this happen, that you know, we tend to make people into victims. And it really does a bad thing because it disempowers them. You know, when you try to blame everybody else for your problems, you're really laying down your own responsibility and your own dignity and shirking your, your accountability. And it doesn't work for us. God stepped in. He didn't argue with them. He provided a sacrifice for them. This is the first death, actual death of creation that we see. He killed an animal and clothed them with its skin. It set the stage for the reality of God's plan in this world. And in doing so, he gave them hope. He, did, he could have just struck them dead. He didn't do that. He made a way and gave them hope. And you know what? God keeps his promises. Isn't that encouraging to be reminded of? He warned them that the consequences, if Adam didn't obey what they would be, Adam knew up front. It was obvious by Eve's response to the serpents that she knew all very well that God's terms was obedience or death. It was a choice. You know, this death, like I said, he could have struck them dead immediately, but this death really occurred 
or incurs in three forms. The first form is spiritual death. Spiritual death is that separation of soul from spirit, from soul and spirit from God, and that was immediate. That's why we are born, this says that we are born sinners, that we have to be born again into new life because sin separates us from a holy God. The second type of death was physical death, and we see this all around us. It's that process of decay and disingenuity. Ah, dis We're falling apart. <laughs> I'm feeling that especially this morning because I helped, uh, helped our son and daughter-in-law move yesterday, and boy, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I could barely get out of bed this morning, but this physical death as we age, or even young people die, death is a part of our reality. All of creation dies. And that death is that separation of soul or the immaterial part from the body, the material part. And then that third form of death was Adam and Eve became subject to a second death. And even though it's not fun to hear about, God doesn't hold back. He tells us that there is eternal punishment, a lake of fire that wasn't created for mankind, but it was created for the devil and his angels who had rebelled against God. And he's trying to take as much of humanity with him as he can. It is a real thing. God didn't lie to us. That's the eternal separation of soul and spirit from God. Death is a real part of our life. We can see that. I want to draw your attention to who did not make excuses in the garden for his contribution, it was a serpent. Did you notice that? It was his plan all along. Remember his original rebellion, be like God? Well, the next best thing was to destroy anything God loved, which was humanity. The pinnacle of his creation, his image bearers, man made in man or humans made in his own image. But you know what? Our enemy is not omniscient and omnipotent, but our God is. He our enemy underestimated the power of God's foreknowledge. God wrote in Genesis 3:16, "And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel." Tucked away in this passage of fall and curse was hope and promise. He is referring to Jesus Christ. With the curse came a wonderful promise of redemption. You may still be wondering, though, why? Why did God allow sin to exist at all? I can't answer that because I'm not God. But what I can tell you, what sin did is that it allowed for the redemption of creation. It is the ultimate demonstration of his love and grace, the fact that God can love us even that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. His grace would not have been able to be fully realized any other way except the contrast of fallenness, depravity, and evil. And when the time was full and right, God sent his very own son, the perfect one, 100% God, 100% man, to redeem fallen humanity. Now, I don't know if you have ever received that payment for a debt that you can't, that God said you can't pay on your own. Jesus Christ, that perfect one, came to earth as a man. He died on a wooden cross, but he didn't stay dead. It was just a heel bruise. On the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death once and for all. He dealt Satan his death blow. Death was defeated. We come to this time of communion. We saved it now just because, you know what? It stinks thinking that we live in a cursed world. But you know what? God provided a way. You've been given those elements. And for those that have accepted God's provision for our inherited curse, you realize you couldn't pay the price that was required by yourself 
that you needed to come to Jesus for forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God, we gather around the communion table to remember and celebrate this freedom we've been given. No longer bound by sin and death, we have found hope and life in Christ Jesus. For others, there's a serious warning. I wanted to be straight with you. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. You know, I just thought we will pause and just take a moment to reflect. Jesus, do you know him? If so, join us in the communion table as we celebrate our freedom in Christ. And if you don't know him, we're going to pause. All you have to do is ask him, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. It was pretty convincing. I can see the curse of this world, and I want your forgiveness. I want you to be my Savior. We're going to pause. You can do business with God if you need to. And then I'm going to pray for us, and we will take the elements together. We'll take the bread, and then we'll take the cup. So let's just have a moment to reflect. Our holy God and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love that you showed to us through your son, Jesus. We thank you that you didn't leave us in a cursed state, fallen for all eternity, but you made a way. You made a way for us to be right with you once again. God, you are so patient and so kind, and we just celebrate your love and grace that you have shown to us. Father, we pray that with, by your Holy Spirit that we would live the life that honors you, that we would take you at your word, and that we would believe that when it says don't do that, don't do it. But Father, we know that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we accept that payment that you made that we couldn't pay ourselves, and we thank you for it as we remember together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.